Hey guys, welcome back to another video and today we're going to be going over, hopefully, everything that you need to know about the Monk class in Baldur's Gate 3. The Monk is the class that I used on my first real complete playthrough of the game and it was a lot of fun. Like I wasn't really sure what to expect from the class but I had an absolute blast playing as a Monk. So today we'll do an overview of the Monk class, some of the races and feats that go well with the class, the attributes, some of the abilities you might pick up as you level up as a Monk, a little bit of cross-classing that you can do as well, and we'll also talk about some items that can really be beneficial for the monk. Before we get started, make sure to hit that like button. It goes towards engagement and is a huge help to the channel and helps other people find the video. Also, comment down below. What classes have you tried so far and what, what has been your favorite? Have you played as the monk or are you getting ready to try it for the first time? Your comments go toward engagement and really help out the channel. And if you don't have anything to say, just comment your favorite emoji. Again, I appreciate your engagement. All right, let's move on and talk about the monk. So the Monk is a really interesting class in Baldur's Gate 3 that can really do a lot of things depending on the path you want to take them. You can be Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender and control the elements. You could be like Chirrut from Rogue One and smack people around with a quarterstaff. You can also basically be an assassin. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with the Monk build. They're capable of filling a lot of different roles, the fighter role, the mage role, or the rogue role. And the unique thing about the monk is they harness the unique mystical energy within their body known as key, and they get key points, which enables them to perform specific abilities. The important thing to note though about a monk is that if you're playing as a monk, you're likely just going to be dealing a lot of damage with just your fists. And let me tell you, with a monk, you can deal some bonkers damage with just your fists. It's also worth noting that your key points regenerate on a short rest, which is awesome, so you don't have to be quite as conservative with them, but you also don't want to be blowing your key points on like a level two goblin. Because as we're going to show, using your key points at opportune times can really enable you to almost one shot entire bosses. The monk can get stupid broken. The monk is also going to make good use of bonus actions. Because after they land an attack with either a simple weapon or an unarmed attack, they can use a bonus action to do one of their key point moves or to just take another unarmed attack. So bonus actions are going to be your friend and that's where you're going to see a lot of the massive damage come from. Additionally, the monk just gets to start with a bonus action doing damage. At first level, after you do a melee attack with a simple weapon or an unarmed attack, you just get to take a bonus action and do an unarmed attack. That's really nice. The monk is also going to gain access to flurry of blows, which is going to be what really enables them to deal a lot of damage. This is going to use key points, but it's going to enable you to attack twice. Additionally, if you pick the way of the open hand, you can use your flurry of blows to knock them prone, to stagger them, or to even push someone back. The monk will also gain access to stunning strike, which has the potential to, well, stun your enemy, which is super good. Now, I do want to note that everything going forward is going to be suggestions for a monk build. Remember, at the end of the day, this is Dungeons and Dragons. You need to be making your character, not my character. So if you have a vision for what your character is going to look like that doesn't necessarily align with some of the things that I say are quote unquote like ideal, then that's perfectly fine. You can play the game however you want to. First off, let's talk about the abilities for a monk and what abilities you might find useful. The monk class on its own has three abilities that it really cares about. Those are going to be strength, dexterity, and wisdom. Strength is important because that's going to enable you to deal more damage with your unarmed strikes. Your strength modifier is going to be added to your damage whenever you uh, punch someone. Dexterity is a useful ability because one, the dexterity modifier is going to be added to your armor class, making it harder for you to get hit, especially since monks are not going to be wearing armor. Two, if you choose to play this way, you can actually use your dexterity modifier as your attack modifier for unarmed hits. Wisdom is also an important modifier because your wisdom modifier is also going to be added to your armor class, again, making it harder for you to get hit. We're also going to talk about this a little bit later, but there's an item that you can get towards the end of Act 2 that will enable you to add your Wisdom modifier to your damage rolls with unarmed attacks. I told you, the monk can deal some stupid damage. Unfortunately for the monk, the ability that it cares about the least is probably Charisma. Now, personally, I like to do a lot of the talking as my player character, and I like to let my player character do like the deception, the persuasion rolls, stuff like that. That's personally how I like to play, so Charisma was more important to me. So I did personally put some points into Charisma, even though it's kind of a dump stat for the monk. If you don't feel it's important that your character does all of the talking, then honestly, you could probably make up some kind of fun background for your monk, like they took a vow of silence and then just give them like an eight into Charisma. Constitution is always, you know, semi-important because that's going to contribute to your hit points. And then Intelligence was honestly kind of a dump stat for me as well. Now, as far as your ability scores go, towards the beginning, I would do something like what is on the screen right now. I know that I said that strength is going to be huge for a monk and that they can deal some wacky damage. 
but that's going to be a little bit harder at the beginning of the game since you're going to have fewer key points and you're going to be a lot easier to kill because you're going to have fewer hit points. I would say towards the beginning of the game, you're going to want to be focused on survivability in the form of armor class and health. And then as you progress through the game and you get better items that do a lot of crazy things, again, we'll talk about that later in the video, there's an NPC in your camp that can let you respec your class for just 100 gold. And then at that point, I would respec your ability points and maybe focus more on strength. Now let's talk about race. And again, you can pick whatever race and be successful as a monk. If we had to pick a quote unquote ideal race for a monk, you're probably looking at the wood elf or the half wood elf. And the only reason for that is because they gain extra movement speed. That's going to enable you to move further in combat and get up close and personal with your enemies. I personally did not play as a wood elf or a half wood elf, and I have found good success with my monk. If you're interested, I went with the half high elf and chose friends as my cantrip. Once again, because I like to do the talking with my player character. The races that are maybe not so ideal for a monk, which again, you can still do, are going to be the gnome, the halfling, and the dwarf. This is once again, just because they have reduced movement speed. Which I don't know if that makes sense because dwarves are supposed to be natural sprinters. And I feel like in a battle, you're going to be sprinting. Damn it, Gimli, you lied to me again. Now I'm just envisioning Gimli as a monk and it's kind of funny. Now, as far as what background to pick for your character, just pick the one, honestly, that makes sense for the narrative you're trying to tell with your character. In my opinion, this isn't going to make or break your build. If you've come up with a background for your character, pick what makes sense. If truly all you care about are the skills you're going to gain proficiencies in, athletics and acrobatics are nice. But again, pick what makes sense for the character you want and the play style you're going to be going for. In my opinion, that's far more important than min-maxing every aspect of the game, but I know there are plenty of people that enjoy min-maxing. And if that's your thing, you really can't go wrong with athletics or acrobatics. Now, as you level up as a monk or a cross class, should you pick to do that, you are going to gain feats. Again, pick the feats that matter most to you or that you think sound fun, but these are some of the ones that I might recommend. If I had to pick one above all else, if you're looking for sheer damage output, you have to pick Tavern Brawler. Again, that might be something you pick a little bit later into the game or once you respec, but Tavern Brawler is going to take your strength modifier and add it twice to your attack and damage rolls. This feat is what's going to really enable you to get those wild damage numbers with your monk. Bobal is another nice feat. It's going to increase your movement speed. To me, it always feels like my monk can never have enough movement speed, especially more towards the beginning of the game. If you're still using a quarter staff or some other kind of simple weapon, then Savage Attacker is going to enable you to roll your damage dice with advantage. Athlete, hard to go wrong with the monk. That's going to enable you to put a plus one into your strength or dexterity abilities. If you fall prone, you have to spend fewer movement points to get up. And hey, you can jump farther. I mean, it's kind of boring, but just ability improvement is kind of hard to go wrong with, right? I mean, just buff up one of those three ability scores that we talked about at the beginning, or a couple of them because you can invest one point into two. Now, this one I actually played with a decent amount and I really enjoyed it. And that's going to be the Sentinel feat. And what that's going to do is whenever someone attacks an ally that is within your attack range, you actually, as your reaction, can attack that enemy. Additionally, if you hit anyone with an attack of opportunity, that prevents them from moving any further. Since your character is going to be within melee range a lot and you might be making a lot of attacks of opportunity, this is nice for just shutting down enemy movement on the battlefield. I don't know, I had fun with it. And then finally, this one's probably not specific to the monk class itself, but Ritual Caster. If you want your player character to be the one that can speak with the dead or speak to animals, then you know you can always go with Ritual Caster. All right, now let's get into the nitty gritty of the three different play styles that you can pick as a monk. Now, if you're interested in just reenacting Avatar The Last Airbender, you can pick the Way of the Four Elements. The Way of the Four Elements is going to enable you to take on a little bit more of a spellcaster role in the party. With this style, you're going to be able to use your key points to do elemental abilities. This can enable you to do some really fun things. I'm not going to go through every single ability that's available through the Way of the Four Elements, but I will talk about a few that I really enjoy. First off is Clench of the North Wind. That's literally just hold person, which is nice. I mean, you get to prevent your target from taking actions, reactions, or moving. Just make sure you're concentrating. It's real nice. You could probably forego this if someone in your party has hold person. But like I said, real fun. Embrace of the Inferno is nice. You get to shoot three to four rays of fire, each one dealing 2d6 of fire damage. Gong of the Summit is one of my personal favorites. It's going to be a radius AoE effect that's going to, going to deal 3d8 thunder damage. The Blade of Rhyme can be nice for crowd control as well. It's going to do 1d10 of piercing to your target and then an additional 2d6 of cold damage to your target. And then everyone within a two meter radius is going to receive 2d12 of cold damage as well. At earlier levels, the Fist of Four Thunders is nice. It's going to deal 2d8 of thunder damage and push everyone back. Fist of Unbroken Air can be a lot of fun, one, because it deals a lot of damage and two, because you can use it to cheese people off the sides of cliffs, which come on, it's Baldur's Gate 3. We all love cheese and stuff. 
Now, Fist of Unbroken Air is a single target ability. If you want to just cheese things, you could pick the Rush of the Gale Spirits. That's going to be an area of effect ability that's going to knock everyone back in the area of effect. Five meters. Sphere of Elemental Balance, you get to pick whatever element you want and then deal 3d8 of damage. It could also potentially create a surface of that type. And then if you really want to immerse yourself in Avatar The Last Airbender, you could pick Katara's favorite ability, which is Water Whip. With Water Whip, you can deal 3d10 of damage and either knock someone prone or pull them towards you. If you want to use the Way of the Four Elements, I would just make sure that you're right-clicking on your enemies, examining them, and making sure that you know what their elemental weaknesses are. That's going to be key to maximizing your effectiveness with this class. Next up, let's talk about the Way of the Shadows. Now, the Way of the Shadows is going to enable your monk to take a roguelike role within your party. It's worth noting that if you're wanting to cross-class, this monk works really well with a rogue. The potentially obvious choice from a rogue class class. Oh my god, that's so hard to say. For me, the obvious choice for a rogue cross-class is going to be the thief because you get an extra bonus action, which just means you get to use more key points or you get to do another unarmed attack. But if you're all about sneaking around in the shadows and using some of the abilities we're going to talk about, I can see a good use from the assassin as well. Getting to attack someone out of stealth, starting combat, and then getting your action bonus action back, that's pretty nice if that's how you're wanting to instigate your battles. So I would personally pick Thief, but I can see the Assassin playing well as well as well. Now, as you level up with the Way of the Shadows, a few of the abilities you're going to gain are Cloak of the Shadows. That's going to enable you to become invisible while you're obscured, i.e. not just standing out in the middle of daylight. And what's nice is you don't have to spend any key points to do this. Additionally, you're going to get Shadow Step, which is going to enable you to teleport. It's kind of like Misty Step, but you have to be within an obscured or lightly obscured area. And it allows you to just easily traverse the battlefield. And what's really nice is it's a bonus action. Then to use your key points, you're going to gain Silence, which is going to create a silenced area. If you're not aware, Silence is going to prevent people from doing magic acts that require spoken language. It prevents you from talking to other people if you don't want to talk to Shadowheart. And it also prevents thunder damage. You can also spend your key points for Darkness, which is going to create a magical darkness that is going to obscure you. Nice if you're out in the open and you need to, you know, cloak yourself. You know, you can cast Darkness, turn yourself invisible, or go ahead and Shadow Step yourself somewhere else. You can also gain Dark Vision, and you have Pass Without a Trace, which is going to give you and your entire party a plus 10 to stealth checks. If you're looking for a roguelike experience, it's kind of hard to go wrong with the Way of the Shadows. All right, let's talk about my favorite monk, though, and that is going to be the Way of the Open Hand, which I think I've said a couple of times, Way of the Open Fist, and that's because, like, he's just going to punch so much stuff. So apologies if I've said it wrong during this video, but the Way of the Open Hand can get stupid broken with the amount of damage you're able to do. The Way of the Open Hand is just all about your flurry of blows and dealing lots and lots of damage with your fisticuffs. If you are going to go the Way of the Open Hand, I highly recommend you cross class over into a Rogue Thief. That extra bonus action is going to enable you to do another flurry of blows, which can just deal stupid amounts of damage. I think there are people that are able to do up to like 400 damage in one turn with this monk. I mean, you're straight up going to break the game. If you are going the way of the open hand, then I think Tavern Brawler is a non-negotiable feat that you will need. It's just going to enable you to deal just so much damage. Additionally, the way of the open hand is what's going to give you the opportunity to use the flurry of blows to topple your enemies and make them go prone, to stagger them, or to push them back. If you need a fighter in your party, or you just want to deal a lot of damage the way of the open hand, you just can't go wrong with it. But if you're going this way, I highly recommend you go strength. Whereas the Way of the Four Elements and the Way of Shadows, I can see an argument for doing more dexterity building. However, they still benefit from strength and because they're going to be dealing melee damage as well. Way of the Open and strength is just going to be massive. Finally, let's talk about some items that can benefit the monk. Now, this is by no means going to be an exhaustive list because do you know how many items are in Baldur's Gate 3? Hint, it's a lot. So I am just going to pick a few of my favorites. I'll also try to tell you roughly where you can get them in the game. However, I'm not going to give you like a guide on how to get every single one of these because some of these involve spoilers. Additionally, it's worth noting, like I said earlier, that you get these some of these late in the game. So you don't want to base your initial build based on the idea that you're going to get these items. Remember, you can respec for a very cheap amount at any time throughout the game. So for example, the first item is going to be the Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength. These gauntlets are literally just going to raise your strength stat up to 23. Like, bonkers damage, right? But don't build your initial character with a strength stat of 8, thinking that, you know, 50 hours into the game I'm going to get these gauntlets. Make your initial build, respec later once you get the item. But as I said, the Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength you're going to get in Act 3 from the House of Hope. They're going to raise your strength ability score up to 23 and I will say no more because that involves massive spoilers on how you get it. 
Another pair of gloves you can get are the Gloves of Dexterity. You can purchase the Gloves of Dexterity in Act 2 from a jock near Jira. I butchered that, sorry. It's the Githyanki Quartermaster at the Rosamorn Monastery. These are just going to raise your Dexterity ability score to 18. This basically enables you to just have Dexterity be a dump stat and then automatically raise them up to 18. Another really nice item you can get are the Boots of Uninhibited Kushigo. These you are going to get as loot at the very, very end of Act 2. I once again will say no more about how you acquire them because it contains massive story spoilers. These boots, though, are going to enable you to add your Wisdom modifier to your damage whenever you're doing unarmed attacks. That's why I said earlier, Wisdom is going to be very beneficial for your Monk. You can add the Wisdom modifier to your Armor class and to your damage rolls if you have this item. These are probably the best boots for your monk. Don't be like me and rush through. I can't tell you, but there's a battle. Don't rush through looking for the loot because you're going to want to pick up these boots. Now let's talk about the big daddy of them all. If you're going the way of the open hand, and that's going to be the gloves of soul catching. You are also going to get these in act three from the house of hope. No more details now you're going to get them, again, because spoilers. But the gloves of soul catching are going to enable you to do one D10 of force damage for your unarmed attacks. And then once per turn, on an unarmed attack, you just get to regain 10 hit points. Like, wild. And then if you're like, you don't need the healing, you can forego the health bonus and gain advantage on your next attack roll. And then, by the way, we're just gonna give you a plus two to constitution as well. Like, they're at the end of the game, but the gloves of soul catching are just super broken. Now I'm giving you a lot of in game items. Let's let's back a little bit to like something you can get more early on in the game. Nature's Snare is a quarter staff you can get in Act 1, very early on in Act 1, mind you. And it's a very good beginner's weapon for a monk. You can find it in Act 1 in the underground passage beneath the grove. It's in a lock chest, so bring along a Sterian or whoever's going to be your lock picker. And you can find this quarter staff and it's going to give you a chance to ensnare anytime you hit someone with it. I think as long as they're not a plant. Ensnaring means that while they are ensnared at the beginning of each of their turns, they're going to take 1d6 of piercing damage. It's not broken by any means, but it's a nice beginner's weapon at the beginning of Act 1. A nice piece of clothing that you can get for your monk is going to be Bull's Strength. You're going to get this at Act 2 from Quartermaster Tally at the last light in. And this clothing is just going to straight up give you plus 2 to strength and it's going to make it so you can't be pushed. Well, against your will. The penultimate item I want to talk about is called Cacophony. This is a quarter staff you can get in Act 2. You can buy it from Lady Esther outside of the Rosamorn Monastery. This thing is going to grant you 1d8 plus 2 of bludgeoning damage, 1d4 of thunder damage, and grant you the ability Thunderous Strike, which I believe you can do once per long rest. It is a very nice quarter staff if you're not going full unarmed at the time. Now, the last item that I want to talk about is going to be probably specific to if you pick the Tavern Brawler feat. And I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but Nyrolna. This is a trident that you can pick up in Act 3. I'm going to tell you how to get it right now, so skip this if you don't want any spoilers on how to get it. At the circus, you go up to Akabi and you pickpocket him for his ring. His ring is what's rigging the wheel against your favor. You get the grand prize of the wheel, which is he's going to teleport you off into some jungle. And then at the end of the jungle, in a chest right next to the portal, you will find Nyrolna. Nyrolna is going to deal 1d6 of piercing damage, 1d6 of thunder damage, but here is the massive kicker. Nyrolna can be used as a thrown weapon. With Tavern Brawler, you get to add your strength modifier twice to damage and attack rolls, also with thrown weapons. So you're going to deal a stupid amount of damage when you throw Nyrolna at an enemy. And then to top it all off, Nyrolna comes back to your hand after you throw it. You just immediately get it back. So if you finish off an enemy and there's no one near you and say you're out of movement, you can throw Nyrolna at them, deal a bunch of damage and get the weapon right back in your inventory. I have had so much fun with this weapon. Also, my voice didn't crack there and maybe I should be concerned about that. My throat is gonna hurt soon. And once you get Nyrolna back, it's going to be equipped in your hand. You can unequip it without using an action. All right, guys, I think that is everything about the monk. Hopefully that is a complete beginner's guide if you are just getting ready to start playing as a monk. I know this is the first of my beginner's guides for classes, so if there's anything you think that I missed, let me know down in the comments. I'm always looking for constructive feedback on what I can do better to help you guys. Did you enjoy this video or did you find this helpful? Also let me know down in the comments. And if you don't have anything to say, just throw your favorite emoji down there. Remember that your engagement is a massive help to the channel and I appreciate it. While you're down there, hit the like button and the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notifications for new videos like this. You guys, get out there, go play the monk and have fun in Baldur's Gate. We'll talk to you later.